end. Good, there are some Spinal Tap fans in the house. That is going to be uh, fortuitous for both of us. Um, so I am here to talk about collaboration and cliché. You would think that Spinal Tap would be a perfect place to start. Um, however, I first would like to discuss the idea, we're going to take one step back and talk about group idiocy. So the slide still works. Um, group idiocy, as I'm calling it, um, is group think as you may know it or you've heard about it. And it's an idea that was a uh, philosophy idea that came about in the 70s. And it was basically the thinking is that it's you know, the herd mentality. Groups are dumb. Groups are idiots. Um, and when I started digging around for this talk, um, you know, it, this just didn't ring true to me exactly. And I came across um, sort of a complete opposite theory, uh, which was more recent, and or at least a phrase, and that is group genius. And that, that struck with me. Um, that struck a chord with me, um, almost literally struck a chord with me, um, because that's always kind of how I thought about groups. And uh, if you want to step inside my head for a minute, this is group genius to me. So this is a band called The Who, who are at the height of their powers in the mid-70s, and when I was a little kid, this is pretty much what I wanted to be. And me and uh, my friend Matt, my friend Matt White, um, would go down into my basement after school every day for BP. Band practice, naturally. And here we are, with a guest turn by my little sister, Sarah. So we would get together and every, every day, um, you know, and we didn't play instruments at this point, but we really wanted to be part of this group, this group genius. And so, you know, a little corrugated cardboard and some wood scraps go a long way towards making fake guitars. And as you can see in the background a little bit there, we would use the handlebars of a Schwinn exercise bicycle um, as microphones. And we would spend hours pretending to be the Who, pretending to be the Stones. For us, we knew that the genius... Uh, lies with the group. And we wouldn't go down and pretend to be Barry Manilow. Not that there's anything wrong with Barry Manilow. But for us, it was the epic quality and the largeness and the hugeness of a group. And that's something that stuck with me um, through the years. There, there are three things that um, I want you to keep in mind during this talk. And those three things are called, or what I'm going to call, and what we're hopefully all going to know them as after this, the three Ps. Praise, prepare, plan. Praise group genius, prepare for your solo turn, and plan for your sequel. So as far as that goes, my solo turn. I don't have any grand illusions that I am Brad Pitt. Behind that cover, I was part of a team. And for many years, I worked at Entertainment Weekly magazine. Um, and that really became sort of my group genius and my band. And you know, it was my creative outlet. And working with incredibly smart and talented people, um, you know, editors and writers, designers, photo directors. And um, you know, on, on uh, our best days, you know, I felt like we were putting out hits. We were reaching millions every week, and um, I think we were a hit. But, you know, sometimes bands come to an end, or you feel like you need to move on from a band. After a decade, it was my time to follow uh, my heart and become a solo artist. So, <laughs> I promise you I still have no grand illusions that I am Brad Pitt. Um, what this is actually is, it's fairly standard in um, publishing, especially magazine publishing, um, to have a going away cover when someone leaves and goes on to pursue other things. Um, they apparently thought this would be hilarious to compare me to Brad Pitt and would envision in the future that I would have to do a side-by-side -side comparison of our two faces. I had a great job. It was a great time. Um, why? Was I going solo? And you know, that's one of those things, you know, going solo, you know, when the way that I've presented it so far, we're thinking about, you know, a band breaks up and you know, then Paul McCartney's putting out records and you don't like them as much as the Beatles records, I know. 
Um, but we all go through these times. You know, if you think about it in a much smaller way, we have illness and breakup and heartbreak and job loss. And there are times that we go from being part of a group, a group genius, a blueprint that we understand and learned and know, and we move into this moment of being isolated and alone. And you know, maybe we're not really prepared to um, create hits for ourselves. And maybe you know, it's not a choice that we made for ourselves, but maybe sometimes it is. In this case, this was my choice. Um, you know, things get real, things change. Uh, the job just wasn't what it was for me. Um, you know, my boss, uh, whom I was very fond of, and still am, um, was moving on himself. Um, the company I worked for, they were starting to sort of chop up, and so I thought, you know, I was gonna deal with the devil I knew and know at the time, uh, versus the devil that I didn't quite yet know. And so I felt that this place, you know, had helped me become a superstar, and I was working among superstars, so this was my time to go out and see what it would be like to take the stage myself. This is what it was like. <laughs> I hope all of you can see this. Uh, this is Bridget Jones from Bridget Jones's Diary. She's sitting on her couch, I believe, polishing off a second bottle of wine. <clears throat> this is what happened to me. The thing that people don't prepare you for when you're leaving a group, and especially you know, a group that empowers you, that epic sort of feeling you get when you're with the group and the, the, the tension and the collaboration and the competition that makes you who you are, that it can be awfully isolating once you do leave the group. And again, you know, we don't always make this choice for ourselves. Um, sometimes um, you know, we do, and we go out on our own and we want to pursue and do new things. But again, there are things like breakups and you know, divorce and illness, and you know, we find ourselves in these solo moments and we haven't thoroughly prepared for them. But as far as I went, um, I don't know, clearly I'm into British classics, um, so there's a, another uh, phrase that comes to mind, or a line, all the world's a stage. I, I, no props for Shakespeare, huh? <laughs> um, well, I had stage fright. Say anything, yes. Um, I, I believe the, the big question in the movie is, um, would you fall for Lloyd? Yes, that was, that was the answer. <laughs> um, and um, so earlier in my life, I had um, learned the, the important lesson of embracing cliches. So here, previously I was embracing the cliche of bringing Bridget Jones sitting on my couch in June, you know, drinking a bottle of wine, depressed, being by myself. And uh, there was a, a more important lesson that I learned from a romantic comedy earlier in my life in high school. Um, for any of you who aren't familiar with Say Anything, Say Anything it was sort of uh, John Cusack's big breakout role, and it became the high school sort of heartthrob and sort of ideal of what a high school boyfriend should be. When I was in high school, it was my girlfriend's favorite movie. And uh, one time, I went to a party, and I made out with another girl. Um, I, th I thought you guys would you know, have more negative feelings about that. I see it's a pretty open crowd here in Seattle. Um, and um, and I, you know, I knew I'd messed up, and pretty much you know, we were on the road to her being my ex-girlfriend. So what did I do? I embraced the cliché. I went into my little sister's bedroom. I took her Sony boombox. I went downstairs, called my girlfriend Gwendolyn, asked her to be in her backyard in 15 minutes. I, <laughs> I went and um, uh, I borrowed my mother's uh, maroon Chevy Caprice station wagon. I went over to White Hen Pantry, the convenience store, got eight D batteries, which I don't know how often you get a chance to use D batteries these days, but it's like carrying like two 20-pound dumbbells. Um, and uh, got back in the car and uh, found my way 
to Gwendolyn's backyard. So I'm standing there, very nervous, shaking. She comes out through the back door of the kitchen, you know, light sort of in the background, creating like a little bit of a halo around her. And she comes out, has a little bit of a hitch in her stance, and says, yes. And you could imagine she wasn't that thrilled to see me. Um, so there I was, again, nervous and shaking. And I raised the boombox over my head. I press play, and in your eyes plays, and goes across our suburban backyards. And a few years later, um, through my job, I had an opportunity to sit down and chat with John Cusack. And I was relaying and recounting this story to him. And there's one question that everyone asks when you tell them of this ridiculous sort of embrace the cliche moment, and that is, did it work? The answer came in this form. The following spring, senior prom, Gwendolyn and I went together. The theme was in your eyes. <laughs> so, back to my Bridget Jones. Here I am, white knuckling it on my stage of the couch for one, and I knew that I needed to sort of do away with the ego and cynicism again, you know, because if you're feeling isolated, it's pretty easy to start feeling pretty down and, you know, uh, not looking at the world in a wholly positive light. So um, I finally got off my couch. I booked a plane ticket. Where to? We'll get to that in a moment. As I was boarding the plane, uh, there was a young British woman who was sitting next to me. We were dressed almost exactly the same. We, I had you know, gray hoodie, jeans, beat up Chuck Taylors. And we got to talking and we were kind of making a joke about, oh, well, you know, what sort of you know, urbane cliches we are. And I was like, oh, you don't even know the half of it. And so I started giving her a little bit of my backstory. Midwestern kid, moves to New York with $300 in his pocket. Um, you know, fakes being a professional writer, where I was really working um, at a temp job. And then eventually, you know, it's sort of secret of my success style, actually get the job, work my way up through the publishing industry to the top of it, and here I am in my life, alone, solo, just like Bridget Jones. Her response was, you are a cliche. <laughs> and, fair point. Um, and so then I go on to tell her why I'm on this plane. And she says, oh my God, you are really a cliche. So I embraced it. And where was I headed on that plane? I assume that there are a few of you in here who um, have read Under a Tuscan Sun or Eat, Pray, Love or the first third of Eat, Pray, Love, the part about Italy. Um, well, I, I did, and I like those books, too. I also like spaghetti. Um, so naturally, I went to cooking school <laughs> in Italy. Um, so she was right. It is a bit of a cliche, but it's a cliche that I've always had in the back of my mind. And one of those things that seems so kind of like trite that you don't really ever want to do it, you just kind of keep it on your perpetual bucket list, well, now I had you know, a, a large swath of time to explore some of my bucket lists. And um, what committing to going to cooking school did for me was it got me off that couch where I was isolated and got me back into a group environment. So is this the exact same group environment that I came from? No. Am I putting together magazines and you know, um, talking about photo shoots and design and layouts and you know, making snarky jokes about the Grammys? No. But I'm coming together with a unified purpose to collaborate and create. And so instead of putting out articles, I was putting out some pretty mediocre pasta. Um, and it, in this photo, it's very cute actually, in the middle is uh, a woman named Michelle, and she is here today with her daughter Kathleen. I, yeah. I agree. Um, she took a slow boat from Vancouver Island. True. I'm just sure there's a joke in there somewhere. The woman next to Michelle 
um, is our friend Monica, who passed away um, in the last month, um, which is pretty sad. She was a pretty spectacular southern belle of a woman and someone who really um, helped me enjoy the group genius of this moment. There's one last thing I would like to leave you with. And um, it's a cliche from a movie. I'm sure you're shocked. Um, and that is this. And this is a scene from a movie from 1986 called Lucas. And Lucas is pretty much considered to be the patient zero for the slow clap. And uh, what happens in this movie is Lucas, who is played by Corey Haim, is uh, a little bit younger, but a, a brilliant kid, so he gets into high school early. He falls in love with a girl. She's obviously, I mean, she's older than him and older than him. And uh, to get her and win her back, he puts aside his childish sort of, you know, geeky interests of um, opera music and collecting butterflies or whatever Lucas did, and he tries out for the football team. You can imagine in a 1980s coming-of-age movie how well this went. Um, so he gets creamed, as you would think. Um, but worse than that, poor little Lucas gets hospitalized. So he's in the hospital. This is a good reflective moment in the movie for everyone to think about you know, their actions. Um, Lucas comes back to school. He's feeling kind of sheepish. Um, you know, he's not really sure where he stands with the other kids around him. He goes to his locker, surprised to find that um, someone has left a conveniently oversized letterman's jacket for him. Um, and he puts it on, you know, swimming in it for 80s hilarity. Down the hall here are the guys who helped him get into the hospital, the bullies, led by Brad. And what Brad does is, and this, you know, we've come to know is sort of a universal moment of, hey, you're braver than we are. You're actually the big man here. And Brad starts a slow clap. And Brad is out there by himself, just as Lucas was, and he is making himself vulnerable, and he's not thinking about how he can be, fit in the group, but maybe here's a time to lead a group and in a positive fashion. Very soon, more people, including Jeremy Piven, whose hand you see in this slide is on the wall and it slides down eventually into a clap. Um, and then there is raucous applause throughout the halls, and it becomes a true Hollywood ending. So, in that spirit, I come here to you as a solo artist once again. As I, you know, I mentioned before, you know, it's not just once. There are many movements we go, go in and out of. So I left my group. I came here as a solo artist hoping to once again join a group. I have left my ego aside, my cynicism, and all I ask is that we can try to create a group genius together. And sometimes it takes someone to lead the group. And you start, and everyone is horrifyingly staring at you, standing on a stage, and you start. And here we are, we have all come together as solo artists and we have achieved a group genius. Um, so the, again, the three takeaways are the three Ps. Praise group genius. There is always going to be a time where you have your diva moment and you're going to want to strike out on your own. Remember though, that most likely you've been in a situation where there was a blueprint and um, you had a drummer and a bassist who helped you get to where you are. Two, prepare for going solo. Um, again, there's going to be you know, moments, as we've you know, discussed many times already today, where you're going to find yourself in a solo artist situation. Embrace it and do away with the cynicism and f channel your inner Lloyd Dobler. And most importantly, in those moments, embrace the cliches. Three, plan for your sequel. So everyone loved Star Wars and loved The Godfather. But 
the sequels were better. And I, that's a fact. Um, at least Empire Strikes Back and Godfather 2. Um, and uh, so what we learned from that is that, you know, that inevitably your sequel's coming. So plan for it and, um, you know, know that you have the ability to strike back and plan for a new empire. Good night, Seattle.